Hi. Uh, so uh, we're having an a uh, impromptu, well, impromptu, a out of uh, schedule I two B two academic users group meeting because of, um, as we'll discuss shortly, a rapid uh, mobilization of the I two B two academic users group uh, uh, to deal with a to think about a response for uh, COVID-19. Uh, there is obviously a large group of participants. I see now 69 participants, 70 participants who uh, are interested, but I just want to let you know that you'll hear, be hearing mostly from uh, me, from uh, 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 Sean Murphy, uh, who uh, was the co-lead with me on the original I2B2 project, uh, from Doug McFadden, who leads a uh, US-wide uh, um, uh, distributed query project, I2B2 project called ACT, and, um, and Diane Keough, who uh, has been uh, leading the efforts of the I2B2 um, uh, Transmark Foundation. So very briefly, given the fact that we have now 75 uh, participants, most of whom, many of whom, I imagine have never heard of I2B2. Let's cut to the chase. So let's see. Um, we start. Uh, we started from uh, the uh, perspective that intelligence regarding facts on the ground is necessary for any large intervention, and uh, that was has always been our uh, our motivation, and. We see where it goes wrong. Here's a picture of perhaps the world's largest uh, um, uh, paratroop uh, deployment. Uh, this was in Operation Market Garden when um, the Allies saw that the Germans, uh, since we had uh, defeated the Germans quite massively on D-Day, that it was th thought that the Germans were treating massively and we'd be able to do a fast win if we could just catch them in the Netherlands. And so uh, there was a, a huge amount of uh, uh, infantry and uh, uh, and light armor uh, dropped onto Arnhem, and unfortunately uh, for the Allies, uh, there had been poor co coordination between the head of the British uh, command and the head of the American command. It was poor intelligence, and in fact, the state of the Germans. The Germans were actually in much better shape than they thought, and uh, as a result. Uh, huge um, losses for the Allies, and ultimately they lost. These are, um, uh, these are British uh, and uh, Canadian and American prisoners of war. And it was a huge loss. Uh, and not only that, because the um, Dutch resistance prematurely, um, prematurely told uh, the uh, Dutch to uh, uh, railway to strike, the Germans in retaliation uh, blocked, blockaded the Dutch, which led to the huge famine in the uh, Netherlands, which caused so many deaths. And so if you look at the military history, this was basically a uh, failure of intelligence. We didn't know what's going on. And so we have something very similar going on now. Uh, we don't know, even though that we have the spike protein which of the virus, which um, uh, requires the uh, ACE uh, uh, um, system to be, uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme system to a receptor, to, as a receptor for uh, entry. We actually don't know whether ACE inhibitors make the disease worse or better. Some governments in, in Europe have taken patients entirely off of it and put them on losartan instead of uh, the ACE inhibitors with some significant risk to these patients. We don't know if that's a good move or a bad move. Uh, there are some who swear up and down that ibuprofen is uh, making the disease worse. We don't know if that's true or if it's adverse causality. Um, we don't know which patients are uh, really at risk. We think that immunocompromised patients are at risk. We think that patients with heart disease are at risk. We don't know. And uh, as a result, we're flying blind, we're flying with rumor. Um, so back in 2006, well, with Sean, we wrote the I2B2 uh, 
uh, proposal, which said, let's instrument healthcare systems uh, so that we can look at entire clinical populations. Um, we uh, focused initially on genomics and how we could study uh, 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 genomics of large populations using uh, both the clinical codified data and the uh, natural, proce natural language process uh, narrative data to actually uh, precisely study those cohorts that we thought were important. We've uh, developed a something called the, the Shrine Network, which is a distributed query system across multiple I2, B2, uh, and other systems, which um, has become, in its most recent incarnation, the ACT Network, which is a distributed query system across mostly I2, B2 systems in the United States. We shall be hearing more from Doug. And this ultimately resulted in the I2B2 Transmart Foundation. One of the off offsprings of uh, I2B2 was a very effective, mostly focused initially on a drug company uh, software stack called Transmart. And we merged the two uh, movements and uh, architectures uh, and, and foundations. So we have a joint I2B2 Transmart Foundation, which uh, is very effective worldwide. And I just want to point out that what a missed opportunity we've had. Here's a publication that we did back in 2007, where we showed an increase in uh, heart attacks uh, just from two of our hospitals. Um, now, this increase in heart attacks caused in the United States possibly as many heart attacks as we're going to see deaths from COVID. And the sad thing is, A, we didn't realize we were doing it at the time, and B, we actually were responsible for it because this was Vioc. This was this was Vioc. Those arrows are Vioc coming coming in and Vioc coming off market. And the point is, we showed with this is one of many such studies that we could actually instrument the healthcare enterprise to look at the data coming in and seeing what's happening to our populations. And so, as a result, um, many others. Um, accepted and not only endorsed our vision, but joined with us. So this is our academic users group in uh, Boston. This is in Erlangen, uh, Germany. Uh, this is, I, I can't remember where. Uh, this is an, another uh, European, this is, uh, that's Ricardo Palazzi on the right. And uh, here's a group in Geneva. So multiple informatics groups understood this and worked with their healthcare systems. But the healthcare systems themselves, the leadership of the healthcare systems, have not used the data in the same way. So even though we showed in 2007 how we could track uh, uh, early the effects of different drugs uh, on populations, it's not become a um, daily decision support tool for management. But that's why when uh, we saw what was happening in the world with COVID, um, we reached out to our old I2B2 academic users group and said, you know, it's at this point that we have a uh, opportunity because we still put the infrastructure in. Some of it is active, some is not, but we can do it to attain a few important goals. One is to move fast. The early intelligence is worth more than complete intelligence later. Um, there are literally dozens of extremely well-funded efforts internationally. Like if you go through the list of them, very big companies, it's all about creating provisioning infrastructure. Very few of them can actually say, here are the results today and say, what's going on with our patients? What's happening to them now? What is the clinical course of disease now? All these other efforts are big efforts. Some of them are well-intentioned. Some of them are big money grabs. Regardless, they're not ready to do this. And yet our community is. And so we've actually developed a community of the, of the willing, of the able, and we are leveraging our I2B to uh, Transmart community. We've been having um, 
conversation to avoid short-term tests that require regulatory dispensation. So how to avoid doing things that would require extensive IRB review, uh, review so that, that uh, informs whether we're sharing row level data for on patients or not. We've been extremely collaborative, talking about sharing, sharing, sharing. And our, we have our initial phase one uh, efforts, which you'll hear more about, um, but it's only the first because um, after this phase one effort, there is a staggered set of analyses that we want to do, and we are welcoming a large community. First, of course, all I2B2 Transmart uh, participants. I can tell you that there are many um, large commercial uh, uh, interests that want to work with us, and, on, and we have internally agreed uh, the following, which is, first of all, we need to serve our patients. And so getting these reports out, getting the analysis out are primary. Collaborations where um, there's contributions of data so we can get better intelligence are at the top of our agenda. Those are great. Collaborations where um, essentially a commercial party is offering a uh, new uh, hosting or analytic environment are interesting, but they're not uh, our high priorities. And at this point, I'd like to uh, stop and ask um, uh, and ask Diane to uh, to uh, direct the rest of it because I, I'd certainly like to hear myself from Sean and from Doug McFadden and more from the foundation. Thank you, Zach. Um, I put together a, a slide deck. I think some of the, some of um, the slides uh, Zach has already covered, but I'll bring up that um, slide deck and we can get going. So we're going to we're going to jump in here and we're going to do a couple of things. One, we want to um, talk about some specifics uh, that are going on um, on the U.S. side um, with a, a a national network called um, ACT, and uh, uh, Doug McFadden will cover that. And then we're going to jump into more of the specifics about the um, national and international uh, data collection um, efforts that Zach was talking about. And I'll have um, Sean and um, Griffin um, talk about that. And then an open discussion about, um, you know, what do you want to talk about? What can we do to help you? So Doug, can I, can you unmute and jump in? And I will, um, I guess I'm driving the slides, so. No. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, cool. Thank you very much, uh, Diane and Zach. Uh, yeah, this is a, a brief sort of introduction into, into ACT and then a little bit of information about how we're um, responding to the COVID-19 situation. So go ahead, Diane. So the ACT network uh, is funded by the NIH, specifically the NCATS division. Um, its scope is to, right now, is to include um, the uh, academic healthcare centers in the United States that are part of the CTSA consortium, which is another NCATS uh, funding uh, opportunity. There's around 60 or so total in the US. They represent you know, most, if not all, of the major academic healthcare centers. And ACT is the mission is to get all or virtually all of those on board into this network. Um, go ahead. So um, this network it has uh, been around for a few years. We've brought sites on board uh, in waves. Um, and so I guess starting back as far as 2014 was when we had our first sites on board. And um, as you can tell, the first few years, there were not many queries on the network, but it's going up rather rapidly now. Um, we don't have... Uh, we haven't compiled uh, 2020 information so far, um, but um, one of the, the important things to know about the ACT network is it's a federated query system. It operates in real time, so you execute a query across the network and get your results back in a few minutes, um, and it's open to the all investigators at 
the contributing sites. So potentially a very large population of researchers. Um, go ahead, next slide. Um, so um, this query network is built um, out of, at its base, I2B2. I think there's one or two instances of a non-I2B2 site, but almost all are I2B2. Um, we use the Shrine technology to connect um, an I2B2 site to um, uh, one of the ACT hubs, which is how the queries get propagated. We have um, a web client, which looks a lot like the I2B2, uh, traditional I2B2 web client, although we're working on a new one uh, for novice users because we have potentially tens of thousands of users out there. Many of them have not used um, the traditional I2B2 type interface. And so we're building a new one that's a lot easier to use. And then of course, for these queries to execute properly across the network, we have to have a shared ontology for querying and for representing the data um, in the I2B2. So um, you can see the basic structure there. Um, go ahead. Diane, you can go to the next slide. So we have a production network. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a real-time network. So we have a 24 seven operations model for it, a formal help desk. Uh, we have over 40 sites on board and end users using it now. In order to keep that production network stable, uh, we have two additional networks. We have a stage network primarily focused on bringing sites on board. So they go there first, we check them out and then we move them to production. And then we have a test network that was originally established for the purpose of testing new software, new ontologies, things of that sort, before we roll them out into production. But we're reusing the test network for our COVID-19 work. Um, so go ahead, Diane. So um, what are we doing for COVID-19? Um, we're implementing a proof of concept in the ACT test network. Uh, we're modifying the query ontology and of course the data at each site to include uh, new COVID-19 coding terms. Several have been created, ICD-10 codes. And uh, we're also adding some uh, sort of abstract terminology in there that allow us to map local codes to things like, you know, any test that was positive um, and things like that. So the um, ACT um, ontology has a, basically a branch for um, all the COVID-19 elements. Um, we are recruiting sites that um, are willing to map their data in a you know, quick mode and to load uh, updates to that data. Um, right now, our target is twice weekly. Um, that provides us you know, with a window into what's going on you know, right now uh, regarding uh, the COVID-19 and the network. Um, we're gonna, the network operations group is gonna be forming test queries to validate the data mappings at each site and make sure that you know our patient counts seem to be roughly appropriate um, so that when people when our end users a small group of end users uh, researchers uh, get on the site um, and uh, look at um, the data that they know that they're dealing with you know essentially uh, correct data and then we're going to iterate through this process um, a few times until we think we've got it right and then we're going to deploy this to the full production network of 40 some odd sites, of which um, some may be challenged to um, map all the COVID-19 terms quickly and to get to twice weekly data refreshes. So we'll have to figure out exactly how we balance that out when we roll it out into production. Um, the, my puppy wants to get involved, but um, I think we'll, we'll let George uh, play in his own right now. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the basics of what we're doing uh, within ACT. We expect to have our first proof of concept in place, so steps um, at least one through four by the end of this week. Um, and um, over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna make some iterations. We have nine sites in the test network that are willing to contribute. Um, and we have probably another five or so that are getting ready to come on board in the test network. And then, um, so we'll have probably a test universe of around um, on the order of 
14 sites. Uh, right now we have around 30 million patients overall in the test network. Uh, in the production network, we have more like 130 million. Um, and uh, like I said, we're hoping to be in production in, a, in you know a few weeks if everything goes smoothly. I think that's it, Diane. I think that's all I had. Great, thank, thank you, Doug. Yep. Um, Sean, can I ask you to jump in? A absolutely. So indeed, I mean, one of the first things we're doing is enabling queries across ACT on uh, COVID-19. And what this means is to create a ontology, right, which um, allows us to kind of all be on a common footing. Of course, it's very important in a network, but even, you know, for your local sites, um, as we go and develop queries on COVID-19, we're going to want this basis. And so I actually put in the chat um, the URL where this ontology is available, and I'm going to now show you um, the, uh, and then I'm going to switch now quickly to the web client. Can everybody see an I2B2 web client now? Yes. Great. So what is basically published in that ontology, um, again, you know, uh, uh, the, in the chat is the URL for it. Um, is um, essentially this new ACT COVID-19 um, set of terminologies. And you can see it includes uh, diagnoses from other trees, which uh, uh, have to do, give uh, ICD-10 codes, which currently exist in your trees, but are called out especially by the CDC to record uh, COVID-19. Laboratory testing with the new LOINC codes that are available. There's new LOINC codes for um, for uh, COVID-19. There's a whole set of them. They're all included, uh, including nucleic acid uh, testing and and from respiratory specimens and so forth. And then there's some therapeutics, as Zach started to discuss, that might be important, right, for uh, studying COVID-19. We just don't know. Um, new things are coming online every day about what might be important for the study of uh, COVID-19. And we just kind of included some of them in our ontology here, perhaps to draw attention to them. They're, they're, they're in other parts of the ontology, so you can get to them. So the bottom line is just trying to kind of, th there's some immediate tools there to allow you to kind of uh, put some stuff in on your local I2B2s and, and, and take a look through this in terms of like, you know, understanding what new codes might be available and how they can fit into your current I2B2 installs. And these will be the basis of queries that we are gonna do throughout the community, um, beginning with ACT. So beginning with ACT and the common way that you know, we uh, do queries across the network um, at, from, from the Shrine um, uh, setup. But I think that you know, we're probably gonna quickly migrate from being able to do these queries across ACT to doing some more detailed local kinds of analytics using the ontology and other parts of our, our systems um, to kind of uh, put together a, a, a number of local analytics, a number of local analyses. And they're probably gonna have one of two different forms. Uh, they're, we're, we're talking about you know, analyses done locally in this case, and it would be a two by two table, right? So for people who are tested positive and tested negative, were more on ACE inhibitors or less on, or, 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 or fewer on ACE inhibitors. And then maybe uh, getting a few, few confounders out of the way like age, right? Because of course, you know, ACE inhibitors might be more prevalent in an older age group. And so you wanna get that confounder out of there. So two by two tables is the first uh, probably thing that we would look, be looking at these local analyses. And the second thing is timelines, right? So timelines which say, okay, from the day you tested positive, how did your laboratory values change? Are D-dimers a good indicator of whether somebody's progressing um, and getting worse? Um, and so those two kinds of analytics, I think, you know, you can see how we can uh, have those done locally and yet compare our results and, um, and get a lot of value out of that. And we can increase the complexity and, um, and, and get a lot of value out of those I2B2 analytics. Um, the third, the third possibility coming later, because this is going to take some effort from NIH, I believe, is to get a data enclave where we can actually put a lot of data in I2B2 format or some agreed upon format. You know, there is a, there is a 
uh, I2B2 to I2B2 to OMOP transform that we have on a GitHub. And so if that becomes, you know, the, the, the format, fine, right? Whatever it takes basically to put together um, our data in this enclave on our COVID patients in order to um, do, you know, really, really high powered, you know, propensity scoring and so forth that couldn't be done any other way. And that I think is a third order mechanism. It's gonna be a while before we're gonna be able to put that together. It's gonna to take work from the NIH to put the enclave together or some, somehow, and that's gonna take a lot of regulatory oversight and so forth. So I'm not putting that in the near term, but, um, but I think you know, this, this unfortunately epidemic is gonna go through several waves and we're gonna be with this uh, virus for a long time. Um, and I just want to emphasize that, that you know, a lot of uh, uh, I2B2 has been organized and, 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 and around natural language processing. And um, natural language processing could be really critical here. And let me give you an example. So if we take the day somebody was tested, in no way does that indicate when they first got the virus, right? So if we want to compare timelines, for example, on uh, you know, how laboratory values are changing or how people are progressing and so forth and compare the, their courses on different kinds of medications. It's, you know, testing is a good place to start, but what we really want to know is when their symptoms started. Symptoms are something you can get out of text from natural language processing. And so I think that, you know, the promise of natural language processing in I2B2 is something that we really want to keep track of as well. And um, you know, be thinking as we kind of think through, okay, you know, going locally and then go into an enclave. So um, anyway, I think that this this community, you know, clearly just by just by how many people are are watching this today, is really coming together. Um, you know, this is this is what we've kind of prepared our databases for, um, and um, you know, it's just great to have you all here and um, and and working together. So. Uh, Now I'm going to turn this to uh, Griffin Weber. Um, Griffin, do you want me to pull up my slides, or do you want to share your screen, or what would you prefer? Yes, can you can you pull up your slides? Yep. Okay. Can you can you see my screen? So uh, yes. let me just say. Uh, two words. So Griffin's going to be presenting um, the tip of the spear of what I was talking about, the phase one, which is this very rapid, let's get out literally within the next week results that can be, uh, that, uh, can be informative. Right. So um, yes, what I'm talking about is what, what sites can do like literally today or tomorrow and get something back to us later this week so we can get a publication out potentially next week. Um, so the, we had some conversations about what would be the minimal amount of useful information that we can extract from our I2B2 sites as quickly as possible. Um, aggregate accounts so that we can avoid having to go through a long IRB process. Um, using existing software or some quick and dirty database scripts or text files so we don't have to worry about setting up firewall rules, installing new VMs and so on, and uh, not requiring the data harmonization, common ontology across everyone, just being it, having people just use whatever local codes they have to get something going. The next slide, Diane. All right, so there'll be a few parts to this. The first is each side is being asked to create four CSV text files just plain old common delimited text files with aggregate accounts. There'll be four files corresponding to daily counts, the number of patients that have COVID-19 positive test results, demographic summaries, lab trends, and diagnoses. Um, you can create these sites however you want. Um, you can use them, you can generate the counts through the I2B2 user interface and just copy them into a CSV file. And we also have a SQL script available on the GitHub that I put in the chat. Um, this is for Microsoft SQL Server, but you can uh, port it to other databases as needed. This is really more of a template. As I said, we're not doing common ontologies for this exercise, so you'll have to tweak the database script to whatever codes you're using. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then you'll send your site, send your files to a foundation Dropbox. This slide's a little bit old. I think of the email that went out, we have the actual link to 
the Dropbox where you'll put your four CSV files. These will be combined into one master combined file. That will be shared among the members of the group that's working on this project for analysis and visualizations, and we hope to publish the results uh, as soon as possible. So next, I'll just quickly go through the four files. So this is the daily count file. The columns are a site ID, um, such as BIDMC is uh, my institution. Um, a date, uh, starting from your first case, each day kind of moving forward till today. And then three guys, the number of new uh, positive COVID-19 patients you have, the number of patients in the ICU, the number of new deaths. And we don't expect all sites to be able to have ICU and death data. If you don't have this, you can just put a negative two as a flag that you don't have that information. And then also different hospitals have different uh, sort of policies on obfuscation. At my institution, small counts, I'm gonna be masking by replacing the actual count with a negative one. So the bottom over there is sort of an example of fake numbers, but what my file at is or might look like. The site ID, each date, number of patients, ICU patients, and um, I don't have the new death information, so I'll match that with a negative two. And then our goal of this is to draw just these little charts, like in the lower right, by date, how many patients we have. Diane, next slide, please. This is a demographic summary table. It lists, uh, each row is, um, corresponds to male, female, other gender, or all patients, and the columns correspond to different age ranges. And this is for all the patients you have that have been tested for COVID-19 positive. Next slide. So the last table is what we think might be the most interesting result here. So Gabe Bratt at uh, Beth Israel Dickens Medical Center, through a literature search, put together a list of laboratory tests that uh, seem most informative or associated with COVID-19 disease. Um, the column on the right shows the, a loin code that was included in this table. Your loin code might be different. You might not even be using loins. You might have some other local code. In the file that gets returned, use these values, these loin codes, even if you are using a different one to actually run your query. We go to the next slide. The way this file works is it shows la average laboratory test values by date relative to when patients were tested positive for COVID-19. So the columns are your site ID, a loin code, and then the number of days since the positive test results. Um, number, the value one is the day that the patient had COVID positive test. So zero is the day before they had that test result, negative one is the day before that, and value two is the day afterwards. Um, the next column is the number of patients with the given laboratory test result on that date, the mean value across those patients, and the standard deviation. So an example at the bottom, I have Beth Israel, uh, loin code 1920-8, uh, the number, the day offset, so starting, you start at negative six, so seven days before the test result, because uh, as Sean mentioned, you don't really know when the person got, got the virus, so we need to go a little bit before the actual test result, and then the mean and standard deviations of the laboratory test. So this table may be a, a, one of the longest tables because it's going to go through each one of the different laboratory tests for all the different days that the patients have had it. Um, next one, please. And the final one is the diagnosis list. This is taking all your COVID-19 positive patients, finding every ICD-9 or ICD-10 diagnosis they have up to one week before their positive test results and just listing them in the file and the number of patients uh, who uh, uh, have that code. So just tell us across that whole population, what are the top diagnoses that are being used for these patients and what types of comorbidities we have. And that's it, these four files I said can be generated um, either manually or through some custom query or using our query that we have on the GitHub and then drop the files in the box and in the next couple of days we'll merge them all together. Thank you. And um, Griffin, I just I just listed I just included this slide that had um, links to the um, your um, your file formats, the uh, um, the Dropbox, and also to the um, the ACT ontology that you can use as a reference that might be helpful. Yeah, a couple of sites have already submitted um, uh, their files so far. Uh, seems to be pretty quick to get it. Others, including Beth Israel, I think partners, we're um, 
we're getting a, an exemption request from our IRBs. Uh, this, these are all agri accounts, so it shouldn't qualify as human subject research. But um, uh, at least I feel more comfortable just kind of going through that step and having a letter from the IRB before I send in the files. I think that wants to make a comment. Yes. So just first of all, Griffin, fantastic work, fantastic leadership. And I want to congratulate the whole I2B2 community. I2B2 community. I can tell you that we're already getting uh, from several uh, hospitals already today um, uh, profiles around labs and uh, pre-existing conditions and ICU status. Um, this is going to be a um, ongoing uh, process. We're going to put out a V1, uh, phase one report out into the literature probably this week or early next week, and there'll be additional such uh, uh, blasts out in the near term. We welcome uh, uh, collaborators who can contribute data, um, and the best way to, to uh, reach out is to reach out to uh, me or to Diane or to Griffin or to um, Sean. Um, I can also tell you that we have um, a chat window on Zoom where because we have 99 participants, I don't think it's realistic to, uh, for big people to speak up. So uh, if you have questions, I'd like, I would suggest you post there. So Daniel Harris wrote, anchor date is the date they test positive. Some patients are sent to us because they uh, tested positive elsewhere. Is admit date to use as an anchor point in view of actual positive date? Well, this was a question that was also posed to us earlier. You know, we've been having now three weeks worth of uh, chats of online uh, videos with our colleagues uh, throughout the world, including in uh, Italy. And this was a question that was, that was posed by the Italians. Um, Griffith, do you want to comment? I think, I think every institution is going to be a little different. Even this, there's, at Beth Israel, our test results come back this, usually the same day. Other sites it might take a week. So even that will shift things around. So I think get the data, submit it, and then document. You have, there's a sign up uh, um, file where you put your institution and um, the, your, your contact person. Put these kinds of notes in there so that we can um, you know, describe it in a, the report that we have. But I don't, I don't know if there's a way for all of our institutions to align with the exact same semantic. Meaning. So, and, and to add to that, for instance, our, our Italian friends are really uh, being hammered in all senses of the word. And so some of their uh, patients came in with a uh, positive test, but they uh, had just a piece of paper that was a positive test. And it's going to take a while for them to figure out when that test was done. So we said if you can't, uh, figure out when it was. Don't make it any earlier than a week before admission. Uh, that's just humorous. Uh, for many others, we're saying if make time zero, the time the test was taken. And so for some sites, they have two tests because of uh, the uh, insensitivity of the test or, and also the false positives. They have two tests. So even if uh, uh, two tests are done, uh, make the test the time the first test was done, the T0. Again, you're getting a sense how we want to be able to share data and share reports even as we standardize because if we wait, if we get too down in the weeds on the standardizations, it's going to appropriately take us weeks to months. And so there's a time for everything and we will, with time, uh, make sure everything is uh, harmonized. But uh, Daniel, you're seeing uh, in real time, the way we're approaching this. Again, if anybody have questions, questions, please post them to the chat. Diane, are there other issues that we need to talk about? No, I mean the the one thing that comes to mind is um, how we how we communicate with the um, community about this, specifically the people who are um, contributing data. Um, I mean, we have a, an I2B2 listserv that people use for technical questions. I don't know if we open it up to a Slack. I mean, are there, are there thoughts about that? I just want to make sure that people know how to reach out. Um, so I, um, I, I, I would argue that um, 
we're trying to keep the uh, Slack community to a group of people who are actually contributing uh, uh, data and are really part of the community. So uh, at the risk of being shot at a later date, I'm going to say, why don't you reach out to me uh, and, uh, and, and if and I'll be glad then to direct you uh, to Slack as, as necessary. Okay, that sounds good. And so uh, let's see. Um, Hans Ulrich Prokosch says, hi Hans, by the way, um, Uli, if we want to provide those data files, whom do we contact or receive our unique institution identifier? So you remember that again, we are going to only share um, um, excuse me, share uh, uh, aggregate data. And we have set up a mechanism that um, uh, Niels Gellenberg, Niels, are you on this uh, call? Anyway, uh, Niels Gellenberg uh, is, is managing, uh, but you'll be able to, uh, we'll, uh, Uli, we'll get, we'll get you on the Slack and then you'll see the channel uh, about how you can uh, contribute the data to uh, a secure uh, space. Uh, Aaron? Let me, let me, Zach, let me just mention something. There's been two links going around about what to do with your files. One is a private foundation Dropbox. And this one, if you upload your files, um, no one's going to be able to see that except a couple people who are going to be assigned to merging those files together. And then the combined one will be sent around with the, whatever site ID you use. You can make up your own ID will be stripped out of that. The other one that, um, uh, that was set up was a Google Drive where the sites who are participating have access to it. But that one, everyone is just kind of putting their things in there and you can see what everyone else is uh, also um, shared in that folder. Um, uh, I don't know if we have a, consensus around which is kind of the official one will probably just merge it all together um, but uh, be aware that there's uh, those two URLs floating around yep uh, we, we will we will do a merger of that uh, with a uh, quick discussion later on today uh, Bradley Taylor um, wrote a very I think uh, important point he says I think many of us might feel better with an IRB determination and might be able to defer to Harvard if that is available. This could help to reduce individual site efforts. Uh, that is a, a good point. I can tell you that other sites seem to already have that determination, like Penn uh, seems to have that determination. Um, we will reach out to uh, within our uh, Slack to see who's willing to share. Uh, what Harvard is actually, uh, from this perspective, a, a illusory um, uh, entity because Harvard Medical School itself has no patients. So we would have to uh, pick one of the hospitals. Uh, Sean, do you think, sorry to, uh, you might be the wrong person to look at. Do you think you would have a uh, IRB that uh, says this is non-human human subjects or something like that? Yeah, so, so we're working on that. I did get, uh, as Griffin uh, alluded to, uh, just, just last night, uh, an exemption where they, you know, reaffirmed that, you know, this is exempt um, from uh, IRB review, essentially, in its current form, where we're simply sharing aggregate numbers and obfuscation, as Griffin described. So that's really the determination that I have at this point. Um, that's very, I think that's very helpful, Sean. Um, if you can just write that in in the slack that uh you know said that the partners irb determined that the the report as described in this way has uh, is uh exempt i think that would help uh, a lot of people okay all right uh Justin Lancaster said, it seems that many were tested with flu test, sent home to learn later that test was negative. Many of them not retesting, but weathering their illness. So if they're flu test, I don't think there are patients. Uh, if they're flu positive. Right now we're just looking at COVID positive patients. Or did I misunderstand the question? Uh, 
Okay. Um, I think the question. I think the question is if they were sent home and the flu was negative. So. But we're not doing at, We're not looking at flu patients. We're, we're looking at COVID patients. So they're being ruled out for flu. Yeah, I think their system is saying if they don't have flu, they probably have COVID, and therefore they should stay home. Um, exactly. Yeah, but ah, that's probably just mild patients. They were able to get the test. So we, we don't have their data then. Unfortunately, no. Yeah. So this is something where I wish the world was different, but we don't have their data. Um, whoa, uh, Doug McFadden, for US sites that NIH has created guidance for IRB reliance, this could accelerate IRB approval. Well, we'd like to see that. Uh, uh, put that on the, uh, okay, you actually, you link to it. Good. Uh, Uli, I know that a study protocol which we would need for a quick IRB vote will probably be a dynamically changing, nevertheless a small chapter with initial so again, um, Sean, can you, did you actually have to put in a, an email to describe what the study was when you submitted to? Uh... That, that's precisely what I did. And I can, I can put a copy of that email in. It was really a very short email. Good. Um, and really, you know, the IRB said yes if, and, and reminded me, you know, of what I think all of us already know, which is it's non-human research when it's aggregate and we have to be careful with small cell size. Yep, 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 yep. All right, and uh, Justin notes that we have uh, uh, this beat 19 uh, where um, they do the, have the citizen science um, uh, tracking, which is really a nice effort, very complimentary. Let me just say that there are literally dozens of efforts internationally in the space. Some of them are going to be productive, some are not. We're just doing our part. We're not saying that this is better, worse, or, or indifferent. We're just saying that uh, we have collectively invested uh, in pulling up this infrastructure. We know a lot about this kind of data and have a lot of experience with it, and therefore we're working with it. Uh, that's a compliment from Justin to uh, probably someone else. Uh, whoever, we're, <laughs> I'm sure we'll all take, we're all brilliant together. I, I accept that. Uh, and Aaron Abbott said, is there a way so, someone without data can uh, participate? Uh, uh, I think the answer is yes, but come, uh, uh, let me be the filter of that. Uh, and here's the thing, I, I just wanna be a filter uh, to, for people who can actually help and not create noise. I, I can't tell you how many um, times I'm being approached a day by um, groups where honestly they're trying to uh, they're, they have their own agenda, which is fine, but I don't want their agenda to create noise for us in our internal process. Um, all right. And there's a question from Gil about the obfuscation threshold. That, that's a very, very good question. I mean, um, I think just to, just to, for the, for the, um, for the, um, VA and other, other government institutions, uh, there has been this less than 10. Um, I think that, you know, that's maybe when you do hundreds of different queries, I think we've kind of been using the guidelines of uh, anything uh, less than four, so three or less. Um, uh, what have you been doing, Griffin? Um, the ACT network is less than 10, so for now, I'm, when I put in my determination letter to Beth Israel, um, I said I was going to mask less than 10. Unfortunately, I have, we have enough patients at Beth Israel that, um, you know, that our numbers are well above that anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's an it's a excellent question. Um, I think that our, our uh, you know, three or less being a small cell size was kind of based upon being able to do repeated queries. And I, I think the act less than 10 was also, you know, so you could keep getting more and more cuts. In these cases, you know, it, I think that that's valid just because we're going to get lots of cuts and so we're going to forget all the different cuts that are available, you know, and so yeah. um, So I think that that's it, you know, the, the logic is extremely valid for 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 being conscious of small cell sizes um, and um, You know, I think that um, Given that we can do this obfuscation. I think that um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, we it, should probably it, resolve it, it. I mean, less than 10 would make sense because that is what the ACT network does. 
It's also varied. I think some sites that have submitted data so far haven't used any obfuscation. So you know, it's kind of what what your institution. Um, it, it depends with. on the size of the cell, right? If the cell right. doesn't. If, if need all it, your, if all yeah. your, and if all you're doing is is reporting counts by day, and it's not linked to anything else, you know, it's still a count of one or two might not be human subject research. So. Uh, it, a lot of it depends on context. If we were doing a study on something very common like hypertension, um, where there's a huge pool of patients, we're pulling a subset out of it, um, that's very different than right now where it's still somewhat of a rare disease depending on which institution that you're at. I mean, I, I guess I would encourage us to have maybe the, uh, an effort to put an IRB in place that lets us um, you know, not have to do the small cell sizes. Um, might even just be a data use agreement, I think, because uh, you know, obviously there's not PHI being um, uh, um, transmitted. Uh, I think I so. think that I think that's right, Sean. I think we should uh, have some sort of um, yeah data use agreement. I suspect that uh, even with our first publication, um, there's going to be a big uh, push from outside for us to be more granular, like literally from the governments. And, um, and we, we may actually get dispensation for even smaller um, uh, bucket sizes. Mm -hmm. But so let's, let's um, handle that on the Slack channel. Uh, wh what's the right bucket size? But I think your, your idea about a data use agreement is a pretty good one. Okay. Um, all right. So Alex uh, Stoddard says standardization and data source latency may re remain a massive lift for many act sites at this velocity with likely small cell sizes masking and churn of results. Basically, I think what it's saying is yes. So I want to, there are many efforts that are, are related with the I2B2 uh, community um, for the real time, uh, for the uh, distributed query the uh, lit data latency is going to be an issue and standardization is going to be an issue. It's going to slow down efforts, which is exactly, in fact, why we think that what we're doing now with this rapid phase one will actually help the standardization of the ACT network because it's gonna uh, cause early convergence. But uh, Alex, you're absolutely right that uh, because those issues have to be resolved for the ACT distributed query to work, uh, that's going to cause uh, some, I think, uh, staggered um, uh, uh, going online of these efforts, which is why I believe, um, I don't know if he's still there, um, Doug has created this uh, smaller net network to actually test it out. Um, is Doug there? Does he want to make any comments? He just did. Yeah, I just made it in the chat. Um, I think to that point, um, with the ACT network being so big and, and people running queries on the whole network, um, we know there's gonna be non-compliance regarding a lot of these things. And we're just gonna have to document it and let end users know where the compliance is and where non-compliance is. Compliance uh, sounds like a really strict word, um, but yeah, you got my meaning. So uh, Katie uh, Kirchhoff, uh, ask a good question. Do we need to filter by a type of positive result or should any positive result to patient be included? So we, in our early discussion in the last three weeks, we actually asked the same question and because there's literally dozens of different tests and should we, should we uh, create a, uh, a uh, nomenclature about all these tests? Well, guess what? Someone else has done the nomenclature, but in the realities, most of our sites don't know which test was used specifically at this point or they do, but it's buried somewhere. So right now, any right, positive right. test will do for these early analyses. Sean, did you and, ask and, me something? And, sure, and notice that, that in that ontology, there's actually a, any positive test <laughs> that actually is explicitly in it. Right. Because of exactly that. that right. Fact. Um, Janet Zanner uh, says, what is a Slack channel that has been mentioned? Sounds like it will be essential for all communication this week. Um, so yes, this is the, um, uh, Slack, uh, a Slack uh, channel that we are uh, hosting um, for uh, collaborators. Um, if you're interested, please send me a note and I'll have a discussion who you are, what you are, what you're doing, 
and then uh, invite you uh, to the Slack channel. My email address is my last name, Kohane, K-O-H-A-N-E, at gmail.com. Um, Bo, when, fold, when will this act ontology be pushed to the act network across all sites? Um, I'll leave that to uh, Doug. Yeah, so um, when I mentioned earlier about our production rollout, um, that um, is not, we haven't set a date yet, um, but um, the hope is that it will be in a handful of weeks, maybe four or five weeks, for us to do the production rollout and to act. The ontology is available and folks can um, materialize that terminology within their I2B2 prior. They just won't be queryable at that point. So um, we're down to the last two minutes. Um, Alex says, has a brief question, which is, what's the minimum number of uh, cases that uh, would be useful? And I think at this point, the answer is any number that you are comfortable sharing. All right, um, it is now, we have two minutes left. Any, Diane, any more comments? Uh, my only comment is, you know, this is moving quickly, so we'll continue to get information out to the community as, as things change. Um, we do have a regular community call scheduled for April 21st, which is three weeks away. It sounds like a long ways off, so we may have another call before that, but certainly the call on the 21st will discuss this um, uh, more. And I can tell you, for those who are involved in these who, and want to be involved in these sprints um, and are willing to contribute data, we, are, we have multiple uh, calls per week. All right. Thank you so much for your interest. I hope you see that uh, uh, this is another way in which uh, the I2B2 vision about the, instrumenting the health enterprise it has been a productive one. Uh, hope to see you in the flesh soon. Uh, more about that later. Stay well, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.